Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm doing another FL Studio tutorial. This is all about some really good tips for beginners and also some mistakes that I see people making, beginners and intermediate FL Studio users. Now there's no real mistakes when it comes to like creativity and music, but when it comes to the software, there's plenty of ways to do stuff easier, faster and more stress-free. So I'm pretty certain that you haven't heard of all of these, but if you've heard of some of them, there's plenty of timestamps in the description so you can skip over them and really find what you're looking for. So let's get right into it. This tip is all about MIDI and before I knew this, this used to just drive me mad. So when I used to start, I used to hate recording with a metronome for a start. I still kind of do, it's a bit, it's not very creative. And quite often what I would do is I would play something So I'm not using the metronome, I'm just playing what feels right. And after I'd finished, I'd just be like, whoa, that sounded really good. What did I play? I can't really even remember where I started, I was just playing something. And it's really frustrating when you're starting out, because when you then turn a metronome on and you try to record that, it's not the same, and I'm sure we've most of us have experienced this. So what there is, is there's this function that's just always recording what you're doing in FL Studio, always in the background. And now I've, I've got this pattern already open here, strings, so you can create a pattern if you don't have one. What you do is you go to tools, and it's right here, dump score log to selected pattern. And in this case, I'm going to choose everything I just played in the last two minutes. So now you can see the MIDI I just played, if I open it up, it has been recorded, it's, it's all here. So if I just press play, Beautiful. And of course, I'm going to have to adjust that, probably quantize it a little bit, make it fit my song, adjust some velocities, but it's all there. And it's recording everything you're doing for the last 30 minutes. So if you're ever doing some sort of like incredible drum pattern and you can't, you don't even know how to put it down in MIDI, or you're just jamming out with your friend and then you're like, hey, that was a really cool idea. Just use that function, drop it into a pattern, slice it up the way you want. And it's, it's just a fantastic feature. I wish I'd known about this because a lot of the time when I was beginning, I would just drop a metronome on and press play. And it's just, it's just not the same. It doesn't, you don't feel like being super creative. And as, as you grow and you develop as a musician, you get used to using a metronome and it's, it's absolutely vital uh, to use a metronome. But when you're starting out, that feature is just fantastic. This next mistake or misunderstanding is all about the difference between the channel volume, which is accessible via this dial here, or in the wrapper settings of any plugin. It's also here. This is just the same dial. The difference between that and the fader here. I've got an example to demonstrate the difference, but long story short, this channel volume is applied before your effects chain, and the fader volume here, or the gain, is after all of your effects and it's the volume that's being sent to the master channel. To demonstrate this, I have a distortion plugin on this arpeggio, and you'll hear that if I just leave everything about the same, there's a little bit of crunchy distortion added to the sound. And now if I take the volume down on the mixer, there's still the same amount of distortion, it's just more quiet. So the actual level of the effects being applied is always the same, it's just that I'm getting more or less of the entire sound. However, if I just leave the fader where it is, and this time turn up the channel volume, you'll hear an awful lot more distortion, because the distortion plugin is being fed with a signal that is much more loud, which means it's going to overdrive and distort. So let's press play. And now even if I turn it down on the mixer, you can still hear there's loads and loads of distortion. So that was a really in-your-face example of the difference, but again, long story short, this is just being applied before all of your effects, before your EQ and reverb, and this is applied after everything. I wanted to go to the drums to demonstrate this next tip, and it's all about really quick and easy ways to slice up samples and chop them. Uh, because a lot of people say that audio is difficult to work with in FL Studio, but you know sometimes I actually don't think it's that bad. So I've got this shaker loop here. I'm just gonna half it just like that. So what I'm gonna do here is try to chop up the sample really, really quickly. And instead of using the cut tool and sort of manually chopping it up like this, there's actually already a really good function just built into it already. 
So I'm just going to copy one down here so I've got the original. You just left click into this waveform icon and just select chop. And you can choose dull, medium or sharp. I'm just going to choose dull chopping. And hopefully you can see when I've zoomed in, it's sort of sliced it up based on the transients and that will change with the dull, medium and sharp setting. But what it means is that I can very quickly adjust this loop and just make it sound completely different uh, to how it was originally. So this was the original loop. You can like make it a, an awful lot more relaxed without having to do any kind of half speed audio warping. So very quickly again, the original one that sounded like this. And the new one with all those slices meshed up. Just a completely different drum groove. This technique works with all audio samples, but tends to work better with transient samples. So stuff like drums or leads with very distinct transients. Again, you just go to that top corner, chop, this time medium slicing, and you can see that it sliced it into every single little beat there. The next few tips are all to do with automation clips, and I really wish I knew these ones when I started. So I have this high cut uh, filter being automated here on this arpeggio. Just like that, and it's just very slowly automating up. What I want to do is apply this automation clip to another parameter, in this case the volume uh, on the mixer. So all you've got to do is double left click on the automation clip, select the tool icon here, and select copy state. Now I just pull open the mixer by pressing this button, or F9. I'm going to go over to the arpeggio, and I'm going to create a new automation clip, just as before. I'm just going to pull that down there. And now what I'm going to do is double left click again, open up the tools, and click paste state. And now it's copying exactly what the other one is doing. So now if I play it, you'll see this volume will slowly increase. And then there's one last thing about automation clips that just drives beginners insane, and I'm getting messages about this almost every single day. So if I delete an automation clip, and then I try to adjust the parameter, you'll see that it just keeps jumping back to the value that it was set at at the start of the automation clip, or at some point in the automation clip. And even if you go into your channel rack and delete it, or you delete it from the picker panel, so in this case, ARP, volume, delete. So I've deleted that automation clip. You think it's gone, adjust the arpeggio, and it just keeps bouncing back to minus three. And this drives people insane because it's nowhere in the project anymore, not visibly at least. So what you have to do is open your browser. If your browser is closed, just left click and drag from the side here and it'll open it up. You have to find current project, initialized controls, and you'll see it just here, ARP volume. Right click, delete event. Now if I open up the mixer again, I can adjust the arpeggio and it doesn't keep bouncing back to minus three. So that's a really, really handy one. No more frustration with those automation clips. These next tips are all about making sure you don't lose any data and you back up your project safely because there's nothing more frustrating than starting on your first couple of songs and then losing them along the way and things go missing and they corrupt. So on every new project you start, at, at the start or at any time during the project, go up to options at the top, general settings, and then navigate to the project tab. And then in this uh, field that's called data folder, just press this folder icon and then set a folder on your PC. This could be on your desktop, on an external drive, on an internal storage drive, wherever you want. Set a specific folder for your project and then everything will be saved inside there. So the FLP and any samples that you record. If you don't do this, then your files will be saved over here. So in the files tab, they'll just be saved in a generic user data folder. And this folder is very likely to be overwritten or deleted in the future. Maybe not this week, but in a couple of years time, your data is not likely to still be in there. And the next one is how to actually back up your project safely. So there's really only one way to back up a project file properly, and it's not by saving an FLP file. It's by going to File, Export, Zipped Loop Package. So just select that with a left click, name it something, and save it onto your PC. This will give you a zipped folder that you can then store in an external drive, USB stick. You could put it up onto cloud storage, give it to a friend, and even years down the line, you'll still be able to open this. It saves your project, all your MIDI, all the plugin settings, all of the samples that were recorded or even just used in the project, and it means that it will open up flawlessly. I've opened up projects from about four years ago. They still open up flawlessly, even in a new version of the software. The next one is a really handy feature that all advanced users will know, but often beginners don't, and it's the make unique function. 
So I've got a drum loop just here. And I've got this shaker loop. And if I want to make an adjustment to it, say I want to open up this one and lower the pitch, something like that. Basically, both of them will have a lowered pitch. The best way to get around this is to just duplicate the sample as before. That's just selecting it and left clicking. But this time with this little waveform icon, left click and select make unique. Now, if I make an adjustment to this sample, it won't affect the original one. So this was the original. And this goes for all of the parameters, not just pitch. You can go in, you can adjust all sorts of crazy stuff and make it sound completely different. And as well as using it for samples, you can also do the same with patterns. So you can just make a unique pattern and adjust the MIDI notes in this one. It won't affect the original one. And you can also do the same for automation clips, where you can make a unique automation clip, try different possibilities, just turn off the original one and see how that sounds. Hopefully this next tip helps you find samples and instruments an awful lot quicker, especially if you're trying to audition lots and lots of samples. So you can simply browse through your samples and your packs all day, that's fine. You can search up at the top with this uh, magnifying glass, but what I prefer to do is to right click, select smart find in this folder, and you can see the last thing I was searching for was a clap, but this time I'm going to search for something a little bit more specific, so strings and I'm going to try and find strings in that pack. So in this case, here's, an actually, here's actually an instrument that I could load if I wanted strings. So I can simply just load that onto the channel rack and play some strings. So here it is loaded up. Beautiful, so it found some strings. And while that was nice, there's got to be more than just one strings available in FL Studio. But there's no way to jump to the next one that's clearly visible. You have to use the F2 and the F3 keys to keep jumping to more searches. So if I press F3, it's going to take me to the next strings, which is the string solo. And then if I press it again, keep going, it's just going to keep taking me to different string samples. What's great is that while these samples aren't actually labeled as strings, the folder is, so they're still coming up in the search. And you can see that it's just giving me loads and loads of different options, even synth strings and stuff. So this can often be just a more intelligent way to search to really find what you're looking for, as opposed to having to just spend hours and hours just, or well, not hours, but just ages digging through your sample packs. If you're new to FL Studio, I'm almost certain you've been in this situation before. So you're working on a plugin and it's covered by something like the mixer. So you close the mixer, you're working on this plugin, tweaking some sounds, and then you go click somewhere else and it disappears. And then you have to go back into your channel rack, open up the plugin again. You're trying to work with it, you open up your mixer, click somewhere else and it disappears again. And it's really just frustrating loop. Now it's a really simple fix, this one, uh, but there's a way to make it a little bit better. So you simply go to the top left, this little down arrow, and select Detached. Now, if you open up stuff on top of it and click, it's going to show up on top. And if I click somewhere else, it doesn't just randomly disappear. But of course, I'm not just going to leave you with such a simple tip there. I'm going to take it one step further. So go up to Options at the top, General Settings, and in the Miscellaneous tab here, select Detach All Plugins. So make sure that this is orange, and then you're not going to have to manually detach your plugins each time. They're going to stay on top until you choose to close them. They're going to have the primary focus, which is exactly what they deserve when you're playing them and tweaking your parameters. This one's going to be a really uh, sort of extreme example of a mistake that I hear on stuff that's sent to me, or just beginner's tracks, and it's not using the Cut Itself feature. So in this case, I have an 808 that sounds like this. It's just an 808 sample, and often a beginner will just, you know, put a note there, maybe put another note here or something like that, and just hit play. And what happens is that the notes overlap in a really awful way. When the next one plays, there's still a tail from the last one, and it tends to sound like this. And then you lose all the qualities of the 808. All you have to do is right click and select cut itself, and now when another note hits, this one will basically shut up and just be quiet. So if I press play, each time it hits, it has that beautiful, distinct quality of that particular 808 sample. And this applies to all samples. So it might be sort of like a delayed reverbed ping sample. It might be a vocal chop. This next tip is great for very creative people who tend to get bogged down by all the technical stuff and just the vast amount of dials and options that are available all over uh, the DAW. You've probably already seen this hint panel up at the top, which is very small, and if you hover over something it tells you what it is, such as panning or volume. But I like to take this one step further with beginners, and what I like to do is go to the top, right click, and open this hint bar. Now you can, you can drag it around using this circle here, 
And if I just drag it into the middle of the screen here, so it's very similar to the hint bar, but it just gives you the information a little bit easier to read. So if you're adjusting something, it gives you the exact decibel value of what you're adjusting. It shows you exactly what's in your meters and every single thing that you hover over, it tells you what it does. For instance, swap left and right channels, reverse the polarity, stereo separation, merged or separated. And if you've had enough of it, you can just go back to the top, right click, hide the bar and it's gone. This next one is not utilizing everything that the mixer gives you. So often people will load up an EQ plugin each time just for a really very basic EQ move. Now I often, I, I love loading up a parametric EQ and doing all kinds of stuff, don't get me wrong. But in this case, this arpeggio, all I wanna do is make it sound a little bit lo-fi, cut the top end out a little bit. So if I press play, there's already an EQ built right into the software just here. So on the mixer, each channel has its own EQ. So I can just duck and start adjusting these points and do whatever I want with it and just create a little EQ curve here. And I can get a really nice result without having, without having to stop the workflow, load open a new plugin, open that window, make some adjustments. Sometimes it's just better to do it like this and there's no quality issue with the equalizer like this for most basic tasks. It's not gonna be the highest quality equalizer in the world, but for most tasks, basic tasks, it does a really good job. So that's all of them for this video. Turns out when I was editing this, the file corrupted at the end, hence why I'm recording this message now. But I hope those were really helpful for you. Feel free to share them with anyone else you think might find them helpful too. I hope you have a great week and I hope to see you in the next video too. Bye for now.